Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, I'm Ann W. Smith, speaking for the Commonwealth Club as co-chair of the member-led arts forum. And I am so pleased to welcome Commonwealth Club members and everyone else to our program today. Normally we would be doing this in person at our beautiful building on the Embarcadero, but we're doing it again today like we have so many things this year, virtually. The arts forum, hold special programming related to the arts in the Bay Area and beyond throughout the year. We're delighted to present this special program today, San Francisco Opera, Reemergence to Centennial. And I'm delighted to be interviewing one of my personal heroes, Matthew Schilbach, General Director of San Francisco Opera. In case you're wondering, 2022-23 season is the opera's centennial year. Well, welcome, Matthew. I'm so happy to see you in person, on the screen anyway. And it's um, such, a, such a pleasure to be with you. It's, uh, I just love talking to you and I just, we love our partnership with the Commonwealth Club at the opera and just thank you for being uh, inviting inviting me in tonight, just because it's always so so interesting, um, and and there's always something new and special to find out from um, the opera, which we don't think about as you know somewhere you learn new things, but this opera company we definitely do, and with you and the leadership, we absolutely do. Um, so be, before we focus on the centennial. My God, what a wait. <laughs> I know. <laughs> a hundred years. <laughs> big responsibility. Yeah. I won't say, how does that make you feel? You know, we'll get back to that. Um, uh, you know, an, an unintended consequence of the pandemic on San Francisco opera or the opera world in general, um, uh, what, would you, what would you have to say? You... You've been involved with the Arts Alliance and uh, uh, in the leadership of trying to get back to opening, in fact, leading the way to opening up. What's been the impact on the, the opera, on the world of American opera? You know, I know it's been challenging, but in many different ways, I personally want to testify that the seats are more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's an unintended consequence, but what's what's been um, a benefit, unintended consequence, a wonderful thing that's happened? You've led us through it. What comes to your mind? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think, and I speak both for this company, but also for the arts community in San Francisco, is just the resilience of arts companies and artists during this time. Um, you know, it's, we're now coming up on the third anniversary of, of the, the shutdown on March 16th of 2020. And uh, almost immediately in that, after that moment, that just uh, incomprehensible moment of uh, sh theaters shutting down, the city shutting down, the arts community came together. And as you mentioned the Arts Alliance and the, the Arts Alliance is a collective of uh, many of the arts organizations in the city uh, of all sizes, of all disciplines. And the sense of just you know, shared perspective of being in this together, of learning together, we had to make up so many different ways of working just on the fly. And, and what, what did it mean to be shutting down? What did it mean to at that point, of course, we were still thinking we were going to get back. It would just be a couple of weeks. We'd be back in, in June. Um, so there was kind of a lot of very quick thinking having to happen. But it happened across the arts collectively. And that was just an extraordinary thing to, to feel and to be a part of um, as, as hard as the subject matter was. And the Arts Alliance 
has stayed together, has stayed strong through this time period. And we just keep learning from each other. We, we are in this together. We are part of an ecosystem together. And I am, I'm just really proud of the city for how it has fostered that artistic partnership during this time period. Mm -hmm. I think another unintended consequence of all of this is what it's meant to come back. And um, as you know, and we, we were back in the house uh, in August last year, we did three full productions, including two new productions. And I have never felt energy in a theater like I did last fall. Um, it was it was as though everybody was experiencing this for the first time, whether as a performer or as an audience member or as a, or as a crew member. It was as though we were just sort of seeing this gleaming object in all of its beauty and all of its possibility. Um, you know, any kind of cynicism that may have been around how we perceive the art form again, whether you know, on either side of the curtain um, had disappeared and everybody was just seeing it in this beautiful, joyous way. Um, I just, I hope that that never diminishes because um, I, I don't think there's ever been a period in history where music has been shut off across mm -hmm. the world like it has been the last two years. And again, just the, the extreme pain of what it has meant to go through those two years of shut off is uh, at least alleviated a little bit by the extraordinary beauty of now being able to turn it back on. So um, I, I, for one, feel very privileged to be able to have been there in that moment where suddenly the hall was full of music again, and you just felt all of that vibrational energy between the stage and the audience. That's, that's why we do what we do. And we've just been reminded of that in the most extraordinary of ways. There's nothing like it. There's nothing <clears throat> like it. Nothing like it. You know, I, I've seen people just jump up and start applauding as soon as everybody came on stage in different times. And the, uh, the point about this alliance, it was really great. It wasn't just the, the large budget organizations. It was organizations of all kinds, all disciplines. It, 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 I've been, been thrilled to, to observe what was going on and how you've all gotten together and said, okay, all right, so now... <laughs> or even right now, what do we do? Right. We have to deal with masking or not masking, or how do we deal with this? And you know, all, all the things that, that are still part of the discussion. Exactly. Can... We're still learning from each other. We're still going through all of the all the protocol questions are still as as uh, they still require as much attention now as they did two years ago. And uh, again, to be doing that collectively, to be learning from it, but then also to take that collective energy and now move towards this sense of how do we tell a story of what the arts is and who the arts is in San Francisco? Again, on, on this very broad ecosystem uh, of, of integrated arts companies, again, make, continuing to make this one of the great iconic cities of the world, that, uh, that collaboration is not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the people have spoken and they've come up with money <laughs> from large to small donations to help make it possible. I've seen that over and over. And <clears throat> so what can we say other than welcome, welcome, welcome back. <laughs> Don't go away again. <laughs> if wow. we can all help it ever. Um, and uh, you, you uh, I'd like a few words. You're in the middle of the second part of the season. There's a fall. And then we have coming up the rest of your season in That's June. Right. What, what are you looking forward to there? This well, we, we, we have, um, so when we, when we came back to the stage this year, again, opera, opera has such a long planning cycle and we can talk about that a little bit more later as well, yeah. Anne, but you know, we, we, we plan generally three to four years out. So coming out of the pandemic, we, we weren't sure exactly what we'd be coming back into in terms of what we could be allowed to do. So we've done a slightly truncated season this year. Um, we come back to a full-blown season next year for the centennial, which I'm so excited about. But it means that this summer uh, we have two operas and a concert. Usually we would have three, three full operas. Um, but the, the first one I'm, I'm so excited about, and I'll, I'll share an image here just to give people a flavor of, of what's coming up, if I may. Um, the last 
one of the key projects of the last few years has been a new set of operas by Mozart and De Ponte. And in 2019, we had The Marriage of Figaro. And then last fall, we had Mozart's Cosi Fan Tutte. And uh, for those who uh, were in the opera house for this, you'll know that the, the approach we're taking um, is that it's a house that moves through time. It's this great 18th century manor house, American manor house. We're telling this story here in America. And we see this house go through a journey, just as society goes through a journey as well. Uh, Marriage of Figaro takes place in the, in the time it was written in the 1780s. Um, and you see uh, on the on the first image here, you know, just the real beautiful period costumes, uh, the real period sense. This is a house that's just being constructed. You even see some of the scaffolding. Uh, the construction is just being finished. And then the second part of the trilogy, uh, which is really this sort of question mark opera in Cosi Fantute, uh, the house is now in the 1930s, the same house, the same 18th century manor house, but we've now progressed through time and we're now in the 1930s and it's become a country club. And it was just, it was an incredible experience last um, uh, last fall to see this come to life and just all of the humor. Uh, you see all the 1930s sportswear here, the swimwear. Um, it was it was an amazing to see this. And America being at this precipice, this question mark in the 1930s, where is America between the Great Depression, not quite the, the Second World War yet? What is Americans' role going to be in the world? And uh, Cozy Fantute is a piece all about that ambiguity on the human scale, on the, the scale of relationships. So it really worked well. And then we go to the third part of the trilogy, uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni. And now the house moves through another 150 years and we end up in this dystopian world. Again, you see, this is a, a model of the uh, set here. Um, it's uh, just being finished down in our scene shop in Burlingame. And now the house is crumbling. We're in 2090 in a dystopian future. And we, we could uh, uh, make references to dystopia maybe being coming a little further earlier than we had planned here, but uh, in a dystopian future, it's the same house still, but it's now crumbled. Society has like hit this, this edge, hit this real precipice. Where is society going to go next? The, uh, the, um, the world of Don Giovanni himself, you know, just without morals, without any sense of care or compassion for fellow humans, um, and sort of his bringing down of, of society with him. So this is now being, being finalized. We're building the costumes at the moment in our costume shop. Um, as with all of this trilogy, there's this very subtle red, white, and blue. Our con uh, des costume designer, Constance Hoffman, has found this beautiful way of weaving in this American um, iconography, uh, American color scheme into the fabrics, but you can see here done with very great nuance. Um, and then just uh, so people can see the coup de théâtre moment at the end, you know, the, the big moment at the end of Don Giovanni is when the commendatore, uh, this, this uh, father figure who was murdered by Don Giovanni at the beginning of the opera, returns as a ghost at the end and basically claims Don Giovanni and pulls him down to hell. It's, it's uh, one of the most dramatic moments of all opera. And we've been building this down in the scene shop at the moment, this massive head, this uh, 20 foot high head, which um, will come on stage at the end amidst flames a conflagration of real flames, projected flames, and it will open up and it will just consume Don Giovanni and uh, as, as Don Giovanni gets pulled down and then the kind of clouds lift and the stage is reset in the epilogue of the Don Giovanni opera and we begin to see what the next chapter might look like as society re-establishes itself. So I'm, I'm so excited for that, Anne. And then um, also very excited that we're bringing back... Um, the Dream of the Red Chamber, this beautiful opera that we did in 2016 by the uh, Chinese composer Bright Chung and uh, the wonderful uh, American Chinese playwright David Henry Wang, um, which tells this great story of two feuding clans during, uh, during one of the great sort of empire periods in China. And it's a love triangle. Uh, it's a young man who is being forced to choose between a marriage of convenience and the true love of his life, uh, this uh, two very different women and, and his journey to try and find his own happiness amidst this huge political tension that's happening around him. Ultimately, the emperor gets um, the best of both worlds because uh, amidst the fe feuding of the two families, 
the emperor comes in and claims everybody's wealth and uh, and it does not end well for anybody. But this is a beautiful, beautiful opera. You see some of the images here from 2016. Since yeah. we did it, it's now gone off and it's played in Wuhan and Changsha, Beijing, Hong Kong. So it comes back to us after having a wonderful um, uh, set of performances in China itself. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention, really important on June 30th, we have a concert with our new music director. And I want to talk much more about Unsung because she's an extraordinary part of our world. And she just jo joined the company this very season. And we have a very special concert with her on June 30th uh, with some wonderful uh, international opera singers, uh, all about Verdi. Um, you know, Verdi, one of the great opera composers who just finds human emotion um, so deeply in his music and will be going through a number of his operas through the different phases of his life and it will just be a, a really extraordinary time for people to come and see the artistry of Ansan, the opera orchestra, the opera chorus and these singers and so um, I'm just I'm thrilled that she's with us and uh, she's changing the way we think about opera or the way we think about music making. So a lot to come up before the before the centennial. A lot, yes. a lot's happening before. Uh, but <clears throat> you talked uh, more recently about the character, the quality of musical excellence that that she uh, brings, and how it affects the audience person watching Fidelio. I I noted how she brings uh, the orchestra right along with her. Yes, you know, yes. She, uh, there's a certain character and quality. That's very, very special. So, so I'm looking forward to more. <laughs> you know, it's it's I, I it's it's hard to put into words. And I, I mean, I think you you really hit the nail on the head there, Anne. In that she, she Unsun brings people into the music making with her. She has a very, very clear sense of what the piece should be and 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 how to capture the composer's intent of the piece. Um, but there's this wonderful um, magic that happens in the pit and on the stage. Um, as Unsun brings everybody into that vision in a way that allows everyone to do their very best work. And, you know, music making is a vulnerable uh, thing. You know, we, we want musicians, we want singers to be expressing their souls so that they touch our souls. And yeah. so it's a very delicate balance and, and there's a unique way. And I do say, I don't say that lightly, but there's a unique way that Unsun brings people into that. And so, and I think you're right, as audience members, you feel that too. Yes, yeah. you, you, you feel wonderful. called it yourself, so really really uh, felt a part of it, a part of the music making. That was, I guess, a way, a way to say it. Um, so the big dance is here. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, 100. <laughs> 100. I live in a senior community and there, there are people here who are 100 years old. So they, they have a special reason to celebrate with the opera. Uh, but What's, what's the timeline when you're looking at Centennial? What's the timeline for confirming the schedule, the production schedule? What opera do you decide on first? You know, any particular reasons? Did you have to recast and so on as a result of the pandemic? And I bet you had to switch around a bit. <laughs> it's, uh, wow, there's, there's, I'll say first just the, the privilege of being at this moment, and it, it's a moment that only three other opera companies in America have been at, if you can believe it. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera and Cincinnati Opera are the only other companies to have turned 100 in America. And to be in a place where we are telling the story of this stage, of this company, of all that has happened over the last 100 years, and to be looking then ahead to say what's coming next you know this is both the culmination of our first century but even more importantly it's the beginning of our second century and, and what does that mean and what do we stand for as a company mm -hmm. that is um exhilarating but also this great sense of responsibility and uh you know I, i'm i'm proud of what we've been able to put together particularly with the pandemic thrown into the mix there and i you, you talked about you know, the longevity of patrons as well, Anne. And we have hundreds of patrons who have been with us for over 50 years as subscribers. And that's just amazing just to know that there are so many people in our audience. And then actually also within our company as well, who have 
who have held a big portion of this company's history in their hands and who have lived it and who experienced it. So I, I hope that I, and I pray that what people will see in the centennial season will, um, will be an honoring of, of all that has been and, and are looking ahead to all that will be. Um, your, your question about timing is, is a good one. And of course, things did make it uh, take some U-turns over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, we Some of the things that we first started putting in place were about five years ago, I would say. And you know, one of the very first things was the new opera by John Adams. And uh, even, even before we opened his last opera, Girls of the Golden West, um, we had asked him if he would be interested in writing a centennial opener. And I'm thrilled that he, he said yes, and that that began the journey that is now moving into Antony and Cleopatra. Um, and so the things were beginning to come into, into focus around that and lots of conversations with the company and the board about what did we want the centennial to look like. Um, but then of course, with the pandemic, that was a critical moment of planning for us. And even in November of um, 2020, um, when we were really beginning to kind of needing to, to finalize the details, we didn't know what we'd be coming back to. This was pre-vaccine even. Um, were we gonna have to do a shortened season? Were we gonna have to do operas without intermissions? All of these permutations and questions. And so it got to about February. And of course that's when the, the vaccine started to be rolled out last year. And we said, we're gonna do it. We're gonna go for a full blown season. Um, and it's gonna be a season that we are extraordinarily proud of with lots of new exciting things in it. And we believe that with these vaccines, we can do it, we can make it happen. And so that's when we really just started uh, working at a feverish pace to, to resolve all the contracts, bring new singers in, even bring new pieces in. Um, there were a few things that had to move around as a result of the pandemic. And so we were able to bring in some new pieces. So the in, in a way that the Centennial was able to take a, even different journeys than maybe we had originally envisioned um, and, and look at some different pieces there. Um, I can talk a little bit through the operas if, that, if that's helpful, that but I will great. say Go that- ahead. We have time. One, one of the things that, you know, as a major opera company that has seen so much on our stage, so much history, there was this question about how do you tell the history part of it? You know, do you recreate the original season? Do you bring back productions that we have had on our stage that people have loved? There were so many different ways we could come into this. And there were actually, um, because the underlying theme of the centennial really is what comes next and, and the, uh, the energy, the life, I think you may have showed the brochure here, but the, this beautiful starburst that we have, yeah. this explosion of our logo into all of these amazing colors and dimensions. Um, we actually went back into our history and we are one of the American companies that really um, showcase new works through our history. And so there were two particular pieces, Poulenc's Dialogues of the Carmelites and Strauss's Die Frau und Schatten, which we did the American premieres of, actually very close together in, uh, in 57 and 59 respectively. Mm. And so we said, let's go back and let's bring those pieces back. They haven't been on, on our stage since the eighties. And let's, um, let's give, give them space as a way to honor the vanguard nature of this extraordinary company over so many years. And so I'll just talk briefly about those two first, maybe, Anne, and sure. let's look at a couple of uh, photos just to, again, to give viewers some context for what these pieces will look like on the stage. Um, Poulenc's Dialogues of the Carmelites is this beautiful opera. It, it began in 18, sorry, 1957 at uh, La Scala in Milan, and a few months later was here on our stage here in San Francisco for the American premiere. And it tells the story of an order of Carmelite nuns in uh, revolutionary uh, France in the 18th century. And it's a very intimate piece in, in certain ways, because it's about this cloistered order of, of nuns and how they are dealing with the French Revolution. But as with any uh, any great opera, it speaks to much deeper societal themes through the eyes of these characters. And uh, through the opera, we come to see their grappling with this choice between their freedom, uh, which they are offered at, at one point, and then their faith, knowing that by following the path of faith, they, they will also face the path of martyrdom. And it's one of the most extraordinary endings of all opera because at the end, each of the nuns goes to the guillotine one by one 
um, in in this moment of great grace and um, this sort of soaring heavenly music. It's it's uh, it's in no way macabre or dark at that point. It, this is faith in its kind of apotheosis. And this this production, which is the first time this production will have been seen in America by the French director Olivier P. Um, at the end, actually, just each of the nuns recedes into the darkness. And so there's, again, there's nothing um, macabre about that moment. It's beautiful. There's a starscape on stage and they, they recede into the, uh, into the heavens. And you, you get a sense here of how the production uh, takes the ascetism of the Carmelites order, uh, these grays, the blacks and the whites on stage. Uh, it's, it's very, very muted in its color tones. But then you have these amazing shafts of light that come in. The, um, the, the way that lighting works in this production creates so much energy on stage. And there's a particular moment um, where, uh, this is the end of act one, where the, the mother superior uh, dies. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, very um, painful death. In fact, one of the nuns remarks, you know, this woman lives such a good life, this death must have been meant for somebody else. This, this is not the death that she deserved. Um, but we actually see her as though from above. So we're looking at a photo here where we're seeing the mother superior in her bed, but she's actually on a vertical plane. And so we in the audience are as, as though we are looking at her from above. It's, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful opera. It's a beautiful um, production. And it began life in America here in San Francisco. So I think that's a wonderful thing to honor in the centennial. Mm -hmm. And then the other of those pieces, if, if the Carmelites is about these muted uh, color tones and uh, the, the blacks and the whites and the grays, the other of the pieces that we're honoring from our past, Strauss's Frau and Schatten, is, is the other extreme because this is the return of David Hockney to the stage and oh. all of the color and the energy. Um, people may remember his Turandot, uh, which we've done many times. Uh, San Francisco has not seen his Frau and Schatten, um, but it is, it is with us for the first time. It'll be the first time it's been seen in 20 years, actually, uh, this production and uh, viewers can get a sense here of the color palettes as with anything David Hockney just full of amazing dense uh, intense color like this sort of super saturated colors and through that we feel the energy and the motion and motion of the characters and this is just a great fairy tale mythic opera it wasn't produced in America for um, about 40 years actually from its original c composition because it's so hard to produce it's big it's expansive there's a lot of effects in it um, but it tells the story of this essentially this empress who is looking to find fertility it's a story about fertility and uh, and womanhood and she comes down to earth to try and steal uh, fertility through the uh, through the emblem of a shadow from a, a mortal woman, and she has to grapple with: Does she want to gain her own fertility by sacrificing the uh, the ability of this woman to have children? And it's uh, it's it's a deeply expansive philosophical piece and full of some of Strauss's most glorious, glorious music. And so, th those are two pieces that we picked because of. Yeah. Again, this is a stage that has seen new opera um, throughout its entire history and, is, and has been a champion of the new, a champion of the, uh, of the forward looking. Yes. And I'll just speak a little bit to the new, new, because if, if Carmelites and Frauner Schatten are new works from our past, we have two new pieces in the centennial that are brand new. And uh, the first one of those um, and again, this, as, as you asked about how we put this together, um, we wanted to really make some strong statements about what is coming up, what is, what is new in the world, what is exciting. And the first of those pieces is the opera we open with, and it's, it's, uh, it's Antony and Cleopatra by John Adams, the extraordinary John Adams, uh, one of the great opera composers, not just of our time, but of all time. And he lives right here. He lives in Berkeley. And uh, he is, um, it's, a, it's a privilege to have him as our neighbor. And it's a privilege to have his work on our stage. This will be the fourth of his works that we have been part of the commission of and the third of his works that we have actually commissioned new on the stage. And uh, it, is, it is a telling of the Shakespeare. It is, it is almost exclusively the Shakespeare text, a few little bits of uh, other texts added in as necessary. And uh, I just love the way the, the production is looking 
and, and I'm gonna give you a sneak peek. I don't think uh, we've actually shown these images elsewhere yet. So you, we're getting a little look here for the first time. This is the model of the set that um, Elkana Pulitzer, our director, and uh, Mimi Lin, uh, set designer, uh, wonderful set designer, MacArthur Fellowship Award winner. She's making her debut with us. Mm -hmm. And it blends the worlds of antiquity with the 1930s. And you see some of those iconographies coming here. Um, you see in the next slide here, part of the, uh, if I can move to this, you know, the sort of the base of a temple, uh, the base of a huge Egyptian structure. Um, and those pieces on stage moving around in different configurations. This is a beautiful silhouette of uh, Cleopatra. She will be at the, at the end when she uh, dies of the, the asp bite, just the setting for that. Um, and the music we just heard in December, the orchestra did some readings under the baton of Unsung Kim with John Adams there. The music's um, propulsive, it's incisive. You feel the tension of the two characters of Antony and Cleopatra. It sort of reminds me a little bit of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and just, you know, this sort of <laughs> the, the raw heat of emotion and, um, and the depth of emotion. As John has talked about, this is, this is a mature love. This is not sort of love's first blossom. This is, this is, these are two characters who have, who have known, you know, really intense moments in their lives. And, uh, and then some other textures from John that people will uh, just, you know, uh, are amazing, beautiful, deep, profound music. So uh, the eyes of the world will be on us with that, Anne. And then, yeah. the other, then the other opera we're doing new is um, by another Bay Area composer. This is, a, this is a part of the world that just has such a great relationship with composers. And Gabriella Lena Frank, who was born in Berkeley, uh, now lives in Boonville. And she has written a new opera that will begin in San Diego this October and then comes to San Francisco in June of next year, June of 2023. On, uh, and it's called El Ultimo Sueño de Frida y Diego, The Last Dream of Frida and Diego. And it's this metaphysical exploration of their relationship uh, taking place on the day of the dead celebrations. Um, Frida has already died and Diego is about to die and he recalls Frida to him. She's a little reluctant to come back from the dead, but she does. And they, they live out their relationship in this 24 hours they are allowed where they, um, they get to sort of recapture the, the emotion, but also the pain of their relationship. And uh, it's a beautiful Orpheus-like story, um, which again is just coming together uh, in real time as we speak. We just had a workshop down in San Diego. Uh, my colleague there, David Bennett, uh, put on a wonderful workshop that allowed us to really get to know the piece. And uh, we have something very special, very evocative coming up. So a uh, new opera uh, at the beginning of the centennial and a new opera at the, at the end of the centennial, all both by Bay Area composers. It doesn't get better than that, Anne. No, that's very wonderful. I remember, um, <clears throat> you know, so much of the Frida Kahlo, <clears throat> Diego Rivera story has been embodied um, across Bay Area um, organizations in the last 40, 50 years. Right. Um, starting at the uh, Galleria de la Raza and other places mm -hmm. that, that showed um, Kahlo's work exhibited it uh, for the first time, you know, in a, on a broader scale. And uh, um, just, 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 uh, why not have an opera? <laughs> I know, and, I, and I'm loving getting to know more about, about their relationship, but, but also about their relationship with San Francisco. And of course, the, the de Young had that great exhibit uh, last year, and then there were the, the murals, um, the three Diego Rivera murals around the city. I didn't realize that they had got remarried in City Hall. Um, you know, they, they, they separated, they divorced for a little while and then they got remarried here right in, in San Francisco City Hall. So I, I love that idea that we'll be playing out this opera just across the street from where they got remarried. <laughs> um, and then the, the director of that opera, Lorena Maza, um, she, and, and she's, she'll be making her debut with us. And I've just loved talking to her about it. She grew up with Diego Rivera's grandson. 
and she was doing her homework in Diego Rivera's studio. I mean, he was he was uh, he had died by that point, but uh, surrounded by all of all of the artwork and just the the tools of his trade and that that has been extraordinary and then the i mentioned that composer gabriella lena frank and the, the librettist nilo cruz um who people may know through um his plays probably the most notable of which is anna in the tropics um he has written this beautiful uh text that just takes us into the sort of magic realism in a way of, of how the story is being told mm. through this day of the dead celebration and so that that is going to be beautiful um how does, so just just a few tastes of what's coming. There's there's lots yeah, more, but there's a few. Tastes I know, and and it's okay. We got we we've, we've got time to talk. I wanted to ask um, that you're, so this is a, a collaboration with San Diego Opera. That's right. And I wanted to ask how um, how a joint production works. You know, how do you decide who does what, who owns what, what the benefits are of such a thing? You know. It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And there is really, there are many different ways of doing it. And there's, there's co-commissions, which is when you come in with other companies on the actual project, on the actual writing of the opera, and you, and you kind of invest jointly in the, in the writing of the opera. And then there are co-productions when you invest in the physical Part of the production now in a, in a world premiere like like these two you're often doing the same you're doing both at the same time um and as you say the Frida and Diego piece is a collaboration with San Diego but also with Fort Worth and DePaul University um so a, a broad spectrum of organizations and then Anthony and Cleopatra is a collaboration between us Barcelona Palermo and the Metropolitan Opera in New York um, and there's, there's the obvious, one of the obvious benefits, of course, is you share the costs. And so that's, that's always very helpful. I think the deeper benefit, though, is that for a new work is that you give it this life beyond its point of origin. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be involved in a world premiere. And there, it's much harder to get a piece on stage for the second time. And so, you know, people, companies like, like to be part of that energy of the world premiere. So in a consortium like this, you get the best of both worlds. You get to be part of the world premiere because you're, you're part of the inception of it. But then the piece itself gets to go around the world and um, maybe it'll, it'll have changes en route. It'll, it may, you know, the composer and the librettist may make tweaks which sort of tighten it up or respond to things that they've seen the first time around. You know, unlike Broadway, we don't have long uh, preview runs. So, you know, the, the first time that the public sees Antony and Cleopatra or Frida and Diego is on the opening night of the opera. And, um, you know, that's the first time you really see it sort of manifest with an audience. And so to know that it can have that future life that it will be seen by audiences around the world is a is a real blessing for any new work and to me that's the real benefit of having these as consortiums and then typically the company that originates will be the company that oversees the administration if you like of the production and um yeah, so for example, ask. Anthony and Cleopatra Who will does, eventually yeah. come back here and, and we yeah. will store it. We will make any, any repairs that need to be done. Um, and then those will get shared by the, by the participants in the ratio of however they invested in the production. And mm -hmm. then if it gets rented out, again, the, the rental gets split between the, the owners um, as well. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good way to to again give a production a much longer sense of life than we might be able to if it was just happening here in san francisco it seems there must be some sense of trust among colleagues to collaborate because who you know each one has different responsibilities and you don't want to just do this with people you don't really know or how you know it seems as though it's an amazing uh, level of trust that works together in the arts you know um I th and you, by the way folks um feel free to, to chime in on the chat i was i'm supposed to remember to <laughs> say that <laughs> I, have, I i think you you raise a really good point there Anne. and at various times as i've been in this in this job in particular for the last uh five six years i've kind of craved there being a marketplace for productions you know it, it feels like one should be able to go and see who's doing what and just sort of 
say, yes, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be a part of that. Or even if we sell a production or dispose of a production, you know, knowing that, you know, the people around the world can see, can see that and sort of say, oh, I'll take that off your hands and uh, rather than it being disposed of. But it does kind of come down to this question of trust and building the personal relationships with other companies because it's, it's a very immersive thing that we do in creating these works and creating these productions. You want to know that they're going to go to good homes, that they're going to be taken care of, um, and that you're working with partners that share sort of similar artistic aesthetics with you. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, does, it does actually end up being much more about the, the relationships, the, the, the human relationships of being in conversation. And I will say that's been one of the tough things in the last two years is not being able to travel, not being able to go to Europe, not being able to be in dialogue with uh, colleague companies. And yes, you can Zoom with them, but it's not quite the same as having a drink and talking about what's what's coming up. And mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. it's amazing that that's where a lot of productions come from. In fact, uh, Madame Butterfly, which is also in the Centennial, um, came out of a conversation. Uh, some of your viewers may have seen um, the Electra we did back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in, in rehearsal with the set designer, uh, Boris Kudlichka. And we were just talking, you know, it's a five hour rehearsal, you kind of uh, get into a conversation together. And I said, what are you working on? And he said, well, we're doing this new Madame Butterfly production. And uh, this was with a different director, the Japanese director, Amon Miyamoto. And he started telling me about it. And he started telling me about the whole idea of it. And, you know, that just resonated with us. And we said, uh -huh. tell, tell us more, keep us surprised. And eventually we ended up joining that. And, and that will be uh, happening in the centennial season as well. So it, it's amazing, again, these, these germs of ideas, where they come from and just being in the right place at the right time, having the right conversation. And again, the, the aesthetic elements just aligning. It's like, yes, yeah. that, that will work for us yeah. here in San Francisco. You, know, you don't, don't always know what aesthetic alignment is, is going to be. Um, with with the man and butterfly, I'm gonna to want to go back a to let's say the last time we um, well I the first time I think I uh, you, you spoke with us was uh, Girls of the Golden West, and it was a very um, ethnically diverse uh, production in terms of the 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 uh, primary singers and characters, and then. Um, then we spoke, the last time we spoke was in 2019 um, yes. about getting the diversity equity community program going. And has that had an impact on the way this um, Madam Butterfly, which has been a controversial production mm -hmm. in different places and That's different, right. you know, places, different ways. Um, so there's like a little through line here I want to make sure we, we uh, check in on. Absolutely. Well, thank you for asking about that, Anne. And yes, when we when we last spoke, and it was uh, Charles Chip McNeil and myself with you in, in back in 2019, we had just established the this uh, Department of Diversity, Equity, and Community, and, and Chip himself was really the first um, diversity director of a large arts organization, I think, at that point. Yes. And we, we were just talking in that uh, session back in 2019 about the hopes and aspirations for that. And I'm, I'm really proud of the work the company has done over the last uh, two and a half years, uh, now coming up on three years, really, in, in this work. And, and I think what's important about it is, uh, and I'll come to Butterfly in a second, but that it, the work is just happening at a very deep, authentic cultural level. And I think that is something that we have come to um, really give space for. And, and, and my colleague Chip McNeil is, is a, has really been a proponent of this from the very beginning, that if this work and this change to become a much more inclusive organization, both within the company and then within the community, it has to happen at a deep level and it has to take the time it needs. Um, and I think one of the most important parts of that is that we have begun to speak internally with much more vulnerability as a company. It's, it's very interesting, as, as I said, I think earlier, uh, on stage we're expected and we expect our musicians and our singers to be very vulnerable. And they, you know, great art is created out of vulnerability. 
Um, and I think we've been trying to find that vulnerability more as a company in all of our work and taking the time to listen, to understand, to really understand different perspectives and how people see and hear things differently and, and to really give space to how we connect to the world. And I, you know, when we did the Fidelio, we, we had that um, exhibit in the lobby of art, uh, which was made at San Quentin prison. And just as a, one example there of just how we can find these intersection points and it's all about building trust it's all about building trust such that the the community of the bay area sees this stage as a place where first of all they're welcome and secondly and very importantly where their stories are being told uh, in ways in which resonate at a deep level and I think as we look at some of the stories that we're, we're putting on stage in, in the coming years, and we announced a few of these already, in, in a, even for the season beyond the centennial, um, whether it's Frida and Diego, Dream of the Red Chamber, we have this new piece by Rhiannon Giddens, Omar, which we will be doing um, in the fall of 2023. Um, and we're looking at bringing in new pieces as well. But... Um, Again, the, the work is happening at a very deep, at a very immersive level. Uh, we're in the middle of a new um, layer of that work now, working with an organization called Accordant Advisors, um, who are also helping us to really make this um, a lasting change mm -hmm. and one that changes the way we think about every aspect of the company. And to me, there are the three key areas that we always have to be thinking about. What are the stories that we're telling? We, we have the privilege of this extraordinary stage and these extraordinary artistic and, and technical forces what stories are we choosing to tell how are we telling them or put differently who are the storytellers and we're, we are thinking a huge amount about diversity mm -hmm. on um on the stage in terms of the the singers the performers um but also the creative teams and all of the members of the company and then thirdly to whom are we telling the stories um and, and the audiences that we are welcoming into the organization and how do we remove the barriers to to even thinking about this as a company that people can trust to tell authentic stories in authentic way in authentic ways um and i think a lot of the work we're doing both in terms of the pieces for the centennial but then all of the ancillary work that we're doing around that uh, we have some really exciting um and i think sort of path-breaking things for us including taking a small version of bohem around into different communities in, in a converted shipping container uh, we have a whole different experience around traviata which we're calling the traviata encounter welcoming people into the opera into the opera house to see uh the full um fully costumed opera just act one though and then and then uh, creating other experiences around that but then something which I'm really excited about, which is, which is a project we're finalizing now, which is a welcoming people's own stories into our centennial and, and seeking those uh, stories out and working with people to find that vulnerability where they feel comfortable sharing their own deep stories. No matter how grandiose operas may seem to be, they are almost always very intimate human stories. Yeah. And, uh, and so telling those stories in, in ways that work for this community. And that brings me to Butterfly and in your question about Butterfly. And of course, it is a piece that has become um, problematic in many ways in terms of the issues around cultural appropriation, yeah. both of how it's written, but oftentimes how it's told. And what appealed to us in that moment where we were hearing about this back in 2017, was the lens which um, Amon Miyamoto is putting onto this, the director of the piece. And he takes as the idea, the, the idea that he, he is sort of wrapping around this piece is that we see Pinkerton, who is the, uh, the American sailor and the, um, who, is, who is often seen you know, as, as this person who you know, uses and uh, but Cho Cho San, uh, Madame Butterfly, for his own means, and then sort of deserts her and uh, you know ret returns back to America with with his American wife. We fast forward in the opera, the be very beginning, we see this all happening without music, and we see Pinkerton on his deathbed, and he is handing this young man a stack of letters or a book. We're not something which we are very we we see and understand to be the story of his life. Because the way that Madame Butterfly ends basically is you have this young boy, um, this young uh, three-year-old boy 
who is the son of Pinkerton, the American sailor, and Madame Butterfly. And of course, Cho Cho San ends up by, uh, by committing harikari at the end so that her son can go to America with Pinkerton and with his American wife, Kate Pinkerton, and, and, have, a, and have a future in America. And so here's this young half Japanese, half American boy who has been brought up by two American parents um, in America, finally being uh, allowed into the story of his origin. And to, uh, I think that just changes the whole lens of the piece. And I, I just wanna share one image with you if I, yeah. if I may, Anne, because I think it really helps, will help people sort of get a sense of how this will, will look. And it's, the story itself is, is told in a relatively traditional way on stage and the costumes are by the Japanese fashion, fashion icon Kenzo Takada. And he's created some beautiful, beautiful costumes for this. But you see here, um, this is when the first time we see the young boy trouble and you see him on stage there, this, this, uh, this young toddler on stage with Butterfly and Suzuki. And then just off to the side, you see this, this young man in contemporary uh, outfit. And that is, that is trouble now grown up into a young man watching his story play out on stage. He's not there through the whole opera. He comes in at various moments. I think the most heartbreaking of which is when he comes on as his mother is about to commit to commit Harikari. And um, it's just heartbreaking to, to see him learning of his story, but also beautiful in that he is now being able to kind of understand um, his journey and, and from where he came. So I think it's, it's, it, it puts a very different lens on Madame Butterfly because this is, this is a story that happened. You know, it's a story that's happened in many, many times over. Yes. It's, it, it is a real story. And I think by giving it the giving uh, giving trouble the ownership of the story if you will allowing us to see it through his eyes is to see it as someone's very personal story not as a a sort of manifest manifestation of orientalism which um can be so problematic for madame butterfly so um i'm i'm really um I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with the community and, and to getting people's reactions to it because uh it it, it is a piece that needs to be told differently. <clears throat> and I'm sure there will be, you know, reactions of different kinds because um, arts organizations are involved with, you know, how do, how do we uh, deal with um, diversity, equity, um, access, um, all those things and how we, are, how we are considering them from a different perspective than that what, what's called the traditional white facing uh, organizations um, and the opera, you know, it, it as a white facing organization, uh, that's fine. But, but, uh, uh, and, you sp and you speak about um, the stories being told and what about the people, the staff who work there? Is, is that something that's also part of the DEI, DEC um, initiative that, that you started a few years ago? It is as we as we think about who is coming into this company again. The storytellers are not just the singers on stage, right? The, right. the storytellers are all of us in the company, and, and how we think about ourselves um, as as being manifest of the much greater trust that we want to have with our community. That that means we need to be thinking about that across all aspects of the company, staff. Um, orchestra, chorus, crew. Uh, in fact, we're, and we're working on a new program at the moment, actually a, a really um, vanguard program around uh, our front of house staff and ushers. And we're partnering with, with Home Rise, which is an organization which we've worked with uh, for a number of years now um, about bringing in people uh, into, our, into the ushering world of the opera. So I think across the company, there has to be that authenticity of, of who we are as storytellers. And one, one of the most powerful things that is, and I think if, you, if we talk about the sort of silver linings of the, the remote communication we've had over the last two years, and um, every month, our DEC department, um, Chip, but also his colleagues in the DEC department lead what we call a holding space uh, session for company members, for anybody in the company. And it is an hour and a half every month of 
deep conversation about race, um, but also about the the history of oppression in America and how it's affecting our arts companies and how we look to the future and how we um, both acknowledge and talk about this as arts companies and then uh, you know find new pathways forward and those have been some of the most extraordinary conversations that I've had in this company and it's just been when, when we found this way and again I think Zoom was actually very helpful in this to open up the conversation mm -hmm. um, within the company without silos without hierarchies and to have those, those conversations um, in deep and vulnerable ways um, again that's that's what arts companies well every company should be doing that but I think certainly arts companies because that vulnerability is what we live and breathe on the stage and we, we have to be comfortable with that ourselves in the within the company yes and I think that's a very um, thoughtful approach and I, I think um, it's uh, something that we we also found this at the Commonwealth Club you know mm -hmm. we're dealing with with public affairs, um, but we also found, you know, our audience, my goodness, it exponentially increased during the pandemic and brought in all kinds of people that had never, so we'll see whether or not they'll, they'll make their way into, into the, um, into the nest, so there's a big nest of, of being involved in, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the Commonwealth Club, of course, is public affairs, but the arts organizations are also nonprofits, and in that way are public affairs entities. And I think that comes across very well and has come through this whole uh, journey with the pandemic. <clears throat> we, and, we are all so interconnected, right, Anne? And, and yeah. I think the, <laughs> Can't the help shared it. experiences of the last two years have only heightened that and, and, the, and heightened the need for us to be in community together. Um, and, and by community, not just you know the what we have historically understood to be our notion of community, but the, the broader community and how can we we build upon that? Because if there's one thing which I think I really took away from this last two years was just what we do, and I, in, from an opera perspective or a theater perspective, what we do is all about community. It's it's about being together in a shared space, being sitting next to somebody and having some of the most deep emotions that you've ever felt next to a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. And there is something incredibly, that's not just, that's not just the way it is, that's actually part of the experience. And that there's something very cathartic and liberating about feeling, you know, these amazing emotional reactions to what you see on stage and knowing that there's a complete stranger next to you having those same feelings. Yeah. That, that's, that's theater, that's, that's what theater has always been about. And again, we're now feeling that at a very heightened level, I think. Yes, and I think many people who may not have associated that with the opera house uh, may may find more themselves more inclined to think so. Um, I see a question <clears throat> about sharing, um, and they're saying "Girls of the Golden West." Yes, uh, will be at LA LA Philharmonic or LA next year. Um, how do you how do you feel about sharing productions? Well. Clearly, it's a good idea. I love it. I love when things go go forward into the future. Yeah, I think the LA Phil um, is is doing a, I think it's a concert performance of Girls of the Golden West. This was John Adams' prior opera that we originated. It went on to Amsterdam. <laughs> Dallas was also a part of that. Um, and you know, once once these operas start getting into the repertoire of symphony orchestras, uh, there was a wonderful symphonic recording of Doctor Atomic, which we originated in two thousand five. Uh, John himself conducting it won, won, some, won many awards recently. Um, you kind of these pieces then are coming into their full maturity when when now they're not just on opera house stages but they're on symphonic stages as well. So I'm thrilled by that. Um, actually, there's there's a new documentary coming out about Girls of the Golden West, which um, which I, I hope people will be able to go and see. And I was just watching a uh, um, a little bit of it the other day and just being reminded by that music and and how prescient that was back in 2017. Uh, there's a lot of what was going on in America there was was happening right on the Opera House stage. And I think to your point, Anne, for people who who may not think of the opera as a place to go and sort of engage in what's happening in, in the here and now, I'd say that is, if we're doing our job, that's exactly 
uh, what we should be doing, whether or not it's a, it's a production set in the here and now or a production set in, in a prior century, uh, what, wherever it's set, it should be telling emotions that mean something to you now. And that's, if, if, we, if we're not doing that, we're failing. If we are doing that, then we're opening up this limitless world of um, emotional possibility for people. Yes, yes. Wonderful note. <laughs> and I think, oh my goodness, we've used up our time. Oh. Uh, again, I am so delighted to, uh, to have you here. We look forward to many conversations in the future. And um, don't forget, you can go to the, um, the, the website, the opera website, and there's, there's many different ways to buy a, a single ticket or a subscription and be part of this wonderful, I love this starburst. It's everywhere on all the materials. And I even got a tote bag somewhere. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Um, and, and so it's, it is important for everyone to have, have a say. You only get to celebrate 100 year anniversaries once every 100 years. So let's do it. Let's go forward and join with the um, with the San Francisco Opera <clears throat> in its Thank centennial. You. Thank you, Anne. And I just I, I welcome everybody uh, who is who is watching and listening to come and join us. Uh, this this is a season of just extraordinarily diverse and rich offerings, both on stage and in the community and I just uh, there's this I feel like the creativity is just surging through the company th surging through the city and uh, I'm just so excited to to get back to the stage and to share that and thank you Anne, and thank the Commonwealth Club for just keeping just real authentic conversation and dialogue and commentary on the world going through the uh, pandemic it's I'm in awe of what you have all done to just keep keep the conversation alive and we're in awe of you for putting it on stage and and making us be more aware of what's going on. And uh, so, so is uh, the Commonwealth Club um, member-led forum, arts forum co-chair. I, I will say thank you, thank you, thank you again. I'm Ann W. Smith, and I look forward to having all of you out there join us. You can um, go to our website at commonwealthclub.org. You can go to the sfopera.org website and find out more about the wonderful arts going on in the city. And so uh, during this, um, this is the Commonwealth Club's 118th year. We had our centennial a few years back. Our 118th year of enlightened public discussion. So what I will say for this meeting, it is now adjourned.